This week on the show, we're going to be starting a two-part series detailing the activities of various BSD foundations. Ed Mast from the FreeBSD Foundation is going to be joining us this time, and we're going to talk about what they've been up to lately. So, of course, all this week's news and answers to viewer-submitted questions coming up now on BSD Now, the place to be, SD. BSD Now, episode 75, From the Foundation, part one, recorded February 4th, 2015. Hey, I'm your host, Chris Moore. And I'm Alan Jude. And we're glad to have you guys with us this week. We got another exciting show coming straight at you. We hope you guys enjoy it. So we'll get right into it with some headlines first and uh, open SSH news today, which is always fun. And this is kind of cool. I was reading through all the gory details on this, but uh, talking about key rotation in open SSH 6.8. Yeah, this is uh, something that mm -hmm. I think will be very useful going forward. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. So it looks like uh, Damian Miller uh, wrote this and he posted a new blog entry about one of the features, which is coming in the uh, upcoming 6.8. Do you know when the release is for Uh, that? I don't think they know yet. Uh, They don't know, okay. When it's ready. Quit making us want it. We yes. want it now. Release it now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so because they've introduced all these new algorithms like ED25519, I think I got mm-hmm. that right. Um, yeah. The problem is that if you've connected before, you have the RSA key and any other key, it'll just be like, hey, that's not the key you know about. Yeah, I don't uh, understand that. And so the they've added this uh, protocol extension. Uh, so that means it's not supported by anything other than OpenSSH right now, but hopefully in the future mm-hmm. this will be uh, standardized. Um, and the idea is that when you connect to a server, you connect with the existing key you already trust or whatever, but then the server sure. tells you a list of all of its keys so that later mm-hmm. in the future, if you connect and you see the EDD, uh, ED25519 key, you're like, oh, yes, I know that that's actually the right key for this host, and you don't get the big scary warning. Mm-hmm. Uh, And then the other feature that this allows is just to rotate your keys. So even if you're staying with the RSA key, you know, I have a a server now where the RSA key is from 2006. And it'd be nice to rotate that with a fresh one just in case, you know, just Mm -hmm. to make sure that no one has managed to get that private key or just for peace of mind or whatever. But if I go and change that, every user that reconnects is going to get the big scary warning. Being like, oh, this might not be the right server. Don't send your password. Uh, so the idea with this is you add the new RSA key alongside the old one mm-hmm. and you leave that for a while and every client as they connect will update their known host file to accept either of the two RSA keys. And then in the future, just you can just take out. out the old one and leave only the new one and now nobody gets the big CRE warning unless they didn't connect at all for that very long period of time. That is pretty cool. That yeah. is pretty cool. So it allows you to upgrade protocols and to just do key rotation without uh, all the fuss. Yeah, that is pretty slick. So uh, in the blog post, he's also got some uh, details on how you'll be able to rotate the keys and eventually, of course, phase out the old ones, just like Alan said here. Mm-hmm. So uh, take a look. This is some exciting stuff coming up in uh, 6.8. And uh, we want this now, but we will patiently wait and, of course, let you guys know as soon as it ships and uh, makes it out the door and we get portable versions and all that. Ah, so uh, at the bottom here, he mentions that uh, when you do, so after you've rotated the keys and uh, so when you first create the second key, you'll have now your clients will have two trusted RSA keys for your host. Uh, Mm -hmm. But once you remove the old key, the next time the client connects, when they see that the old RSA key is not in the list being sent by the server, it'll remove it from your known host file. So now if someone did manage to steal the old key, you won't still trust their uh, that old key. So as oh, you remove cool. the uh, old key, um, they get removed from the known hosts on all the clients as well. And also, oh, uh, the updating of the known host file can be disabled using the uh, new update host keys option in your SSH underscore config if for some reason you don't want it to be automatically trusting new keys if you're extra paranoid or whatever. Okay, well, that's pretty slick. So the client will clean up after itself. I like this. Yeah, need to see this everywhere. I I imagine people, why don't Putty do this yet? Yeah, it'll get there eventually. But yeah, this is pretty slick, guys. Keep up the good work, uh, OpenSSH developers. 
We are excited for this. Um, okay, next up, we got some cool NetBSD news this week. Uh, some banana pie images have made their way onto the internet. I don't know. Every time I say that, I get hungry, but that mm-hmm. just sounds good. Anyway, we've we've talked a little bit about the banana pie before. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's another small ARM board that would be comparable to, say, to a Raspberry Pi. It's a dual-core 1 gigahertz. But uh, some NetBSD current images have been posted onto the mailing list. So now you can get some cool BSD action on mm-hmm. one of these old devices, which is pretty slick. Um, they even include a, a set of pre built package source packages. So you don't even have to compile anything on that uh, lower end uh-huh. processor. So that's, that's that, the fancy thing. That's the trick, right? A lot of the times it's like you can get the operating system, but before you do anything, you need to compile all this. And, and it'll you know, take forever. Forever, yeah, yeah. So this is going to save you some of that work, which is pretty cool. And uh, in the email, there's a lot of steps talking about how to get everything working. There's an overview of all the software that comes with the image. And we have a link to the wiki page where you can see some related boards and further instructions on getting it set up as well. Yeah, they even have it here going uh, using Musica to do DLNA and play it, make a music mm-hmm. server or a uh, bunch of different things you might want to do with it. Yeah, that's pretty slick. Mm-hmm. But uh, related to that, we also want to mention NetBSD recently added a GPU acceleration for the Raspberry Pi, which is a uh, first for their ARM port. So nice. that is pretty cool, guys. Yeah, that's that's nice to have. It'll in. be I interesting guess that'll... to see what happens with the Raspberry Pi 2 as well. Yeah, that's the what the quad core one they just announced, I believe. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not sure on the specs, but it's yeah the new Raspberry Pi they just announced, which is apparently mm-hmm. up to six times faster uh, and for the same thirty five dollar price tag. Yeah, which is pretty slick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that those are going to be great little media center boxes someday. Yeah, it's it's funny the Raspberry Pi was supposed to be designed to be this uh, cheap low power computer used to teach people programming and everybody just wants it as a cheap desktop or right. embedded <laughs> server or music player they're or like that's my plex home theater player. system right there exactly <laughs> but yeah that, that's pretty cool so uh, we'll keep an eye on that and yeah that new raspberry pi revision i would look forward to seeing some gpu acceleration show up in that because yeah i think i looked at the specs last night it's a quad core or something or another and it's starting to get into the realm of, wow, we can do some really neat multimedia mm-hmm. things with this. This is pretty slick. Especially with GPU acceleration. That's right. That's right. I wonder how those would work as routers too, Alan. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the uh, biggest problem is they only have one network card. And the big wonder? difference is the, the network card on the Raspberry Pi 2 is actually gigabit and can apparently mm-hmm. push like 400 megabits uh, based on oh, the nice. process. Whereas the uh, one... Uh, on the Raspberry Pi 1 is uh, USB connected and tops out at like 64 megabits. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm looking here. The Banana Pi is a gigabit Ethernet, and it has uh, some extra jacks. And I wonder if you could connect a second Ethernet. I don't know. It, me, if you guys hack on that, if anybody's done something like that, let us know. That would be cool to feature in a future episode how you turn that into a little router box. Mm-hmm. Okay, so next up we have some uh, Libra SSL t-shirts are now available and, of course, a lot of other BSD goodies. So mm. if, uh, if you, of course, been paying attention to any of the security stuff this year, you no doubt know what Libra SSL is at this point and have followed that saga. But you may want the shirt to show your support now. And they're finally available to buy online. So you have those up where people can see what they look like, Alan? Yeah. Uh, so they have uh, Keep Calm and Choose Libra SSL or Keep Calm nice. and Abandon Open SSL. <laughs> nice. I like it. So, yeah, those those are definitely going to be hot, guys. you got to get those and, uh, of course, wear these to all the Linux conferences you go to and whatnot. That's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, while we're on the topic, we, should, of course, mention there's a bunch of other places where you can get T-shirts and other uh, related merchandise for the BSD project. Mm-hmm. So, uh, of course, uh, FreeBSD, PCBSD, and FreeNAS stuff is all available at FreeBSDMall.com. Mm-hmm. So you'll want to check that out. they got a, a wide variety of things. Um, OpenBSD also recently launched their store, which is uh, OpenBSDStore.com. The selection's still a little limited, but uh, they're working on it, so definitely go check that out. And uh, NetBSD as well has a, a couple sites here, and we have uh, links to that. The URL's a little long to mention, but uh, check it out in the show notes where you can buy shirts and, of course, other apparel with their traditional flag logo on it. Um, we couldn't find any dragonfly stuff, so if anyone knows where you could pick some of that us uh, pick some of that up, let us know because of course uh, their logo is pretty cool, so we mm-hmm. need to see that. 
But uh, apart from mentioning that you can you know, get this stuff to show your pride and your BSD of choice, uh, profits of those sales of the gear tend to go back to the projects. So yep. you know, you're picking up swag for yourself, but you're also supporting the BSD of your choice. So uh, that's a good thing to do. And uh, yep. I know these are really cool to wear to the conference. And you know, well. exactly. Uh, wearing it also supports the project because you get right. uh, your random uh, Linux people and so on to hear about it and wonder what it is. and. You know, the, I don't think anything at the Linux conference markets BSD better than the flashing horns, and everybody's like, "Where did you get those? What are those? Right. What's what's going on here?" Well, so my my closet's full of just conference T-shirts, right? I got oh, yeah. BSD shirts for every occasion, and I wear them everywhere. And I remember one time, uh, I live you know in a small town here in uh, Tennessee, and I don't run into a lot of free BSD people locally, right? Right. But I was wearing one of my uh, BSD can shirts, and I walked into Home Depot to go pick up something or another. And a guy stopped me who knew what FreeBSD was, and he was some sysadmin up at some AT and T office up in Knoxville. And yeah, mm-hmm. we chatted for a bit, and that's pretty cool, you know, just to find out if there's other users nearby you. Yep, yeah, uh, I had the uh, New York City BSD Con uh, T-shirt on when I was at uh, the grocery store, and one of the guys working there was like, "Yeah, I used to be a Linux man." I was like, "Ah, oh, cool." <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's always interesting to run into people that know what BSD is. Mm-hmm. Okay, next up, so OpenSense. We yes. talked about them the past couple of weeks, and uh, they've been hard at work since we last spoke yeah, it's to them. Yeah, interesting. Uh, <laughs> they, they had this plan for this, you know, one release every six months, and that was it, and it was all going to be fine. <laughs> uh, they've right. made uh, four patches to uh, 15.1 so far, although uh, part of that was, you know, they had to fix the uh, FreeBSD uh, security vulnerabilities uh, when those were announced, yeah. so they got those out. Also updated their time zone data and uh, mm-hmm. fixed their SSHD config and uh, saw some issues with the GUI and so on while they were at it. Cool. Yeah, so 15.1.4 is now out, and that hopefully is the latest, assuming they haven't released something yet again before this episode airs. So. Uh, and they have some stats Definitely here. That they've had approximately 3,000 downloads of their five releases of uh, open sets. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah. And uh, well, Keep up the good work, folks. And I know they mentioned they're working on how to do updating of the base system and whatnot, yeah. and they're looking at using PackageNG for that. So uh, hopefully that'll make its way into a future release probably next week, right? Right. Uh, so yes, uh, they currently have not actually resolved the uh, the SCTP vulnerabilities, although uh, you're likely not using SCTP, so it's probably not that uh, urgent. But sure. yes, they don't actually have the facilities to update the uh, the firmware of the actual FreeBSD base system itself, only the packages, so they have to uh, sort something out for that. So I guess they're not running like a FreeBSD update no. server or anything yet. Yeah. Hey, if you guys want to know how to do that, email me. I can share some of the pain yep. we went through getting that set up. But it is doable. Yep. And so, uh, it, I don't know if we if we mentioned it before, but also um, PFSense 2.2, which is based on the latest FreeBSD 10.1, is out as well. Uh, that came uh-huh. out of uh, their release candidate, I think. So that's definitely oh, worth fantastic. checking out as well. Yeah, definitely. It's nice to see these firewall projects getting updated, and I can use you know different uh, NICs with them yes. now that I purchase. All the drivers are there now. Yeah, that, so that's that, awesome. That's the big advantage to uh, PFSense switching mm-hmm. to ten point one is it'll have all the latest yep. drivers. They tried to backport a bunch of them uh, with uh, two dot one when they went with eight, uh, but you know you can't beat having ten as a base. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, cool. And if any of you guys are already running OpenSense uh, as their gateway firewall, you know, drop us a line. We'd be curious to know how it's working mm-hmm. for you and get some user feedback for them. Yes. Okay, so before we do our interview this week, of course, we want to mention the first sponsor of the show, which is DigitalOcean. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, URLs, digitalocean.com. And you want to go there, get signed up. You need a VM. Everyone needs a VM somewhere, right? Yes. And if you're going to host it, do it with DigitalOcean where you can get free BSD loaded on it by default. Mm-hmm. And we have the special coupon code FreeBSD now, which will give you uh, basically a ten dollar credit. Yep. So that could be two months free yes, the, of hosting your own cloud VM. How cool is yeah, that? The lowest Go end uh, server they have there is five dollars a month. So with the ten dollar credit, you don't even have to put your credit card in for the first two months. Uh, you can That's deploy fantastic. your new server in under fifty five seconds, or as little as fifty five seconds. As soon as you go into the web interface and say "spin me up a server," a minute later, there's mm-hmm. a server. Uh, Nice. Part of the reason for that is all their servers are backed by SSDs, which makes them boot very quickly. Very quick, yes. <laughs> uh, you get good tier one bandwidth. Uh, you get a full uh, gigabit interface uh, and start with a terabyte per month of bandwidth and you can buy more if you need it. Uh, it's mm. all based on the KVM virtualization stuff. So it's you know modern virtualization, not something old. Uh, they have a great mm. control panel that's very easy to use. 
but also uh, they have an API, so if you want to do it programmatically, you can do that as well. Nice. So you can kind of just spin them up on the fly. That's pretty yes. slick. Uh, the other thing so, they have is yeah. private networking. So if you have more than one VM with them, even if it's in uh, their different data centers all over the globe, uh, you get mm -hmm. a, a back-end network between your VMs where they don't count the amount of bandwidth you use. So oh, if nice. you want to okay. back up to a, a VM in a different country in case something happens yeah. or whatever, uh, or if you want to just... from New York to Singapore or something. Right, or if you just want to do you know, a little mini CDN or whatever, uh, you can sync mm -hmm. between the two VMs without it using up uh, your one terabyte a month of bandwidth so that you don't have to pay for it. So you get nice oh, private networking, like. yeah, which is great even if you're just in the same data center, you build one VM for your database and one mm -hmm. for your web front end or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have their... Uh, data centers in Amsterdam and Europe, uh, San Francisco, New York, and then London and Singapore. And you can also uh, transfer copies of your droplets between those regions, and they have a snapshotting system so that you can snapshot your VM and then clone it and so on, just kind of like ZFS. Cool. Well, again, DigitalOcean.com, go sign up and enter that coupon code FREEBSD now to get set up. Oh, yes, and they have IPv6. That's something oh, yes, a lot yes, of people ask for. IPv6. Mm -hmm. We're joined now by Ed Mass, the FreeBSD Foundation's Director of Project Development. We're uh, glad to have you on the show today, Ed. Nice. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, of course, we'll ask you the same uh, that we ask everyone. So, what's your first experience with BSD in general? How did you get involved and get to this point? So, my first uh, experience with BSD wasn't from FreeBSD or NetBSD or OpenBSD. It was actually um, with the BSD stack, uh, network stack. And it was uh, while well, I was a co-op student at a video, video streaming hardware startup in, uh, in Waterloo, uh, where I live, Waterloo, Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they used VXWorks mm -hmm. as their real-time operating system, uh, which uses the BSD network stack uh, and a whole bunch of other, other components. But... Uh, that's where I, I first was exposed to, uh, to BSD. And then that company was, uh, was acquired at, at one point. It was subsequently shut down and formed a new startup in the early 2000s. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that, that point, we needed an operating system that could thousands of simultaneous TCP connections. And at that point, FreeBSD had KQ, and ePool didn't yet really exist on Linux. They were both coming around around the same time, but KQ was, was working and usable. And so basically FreeBSD was chosen for this startup and has, the rest, as they say, is history. That's where I got started with, with BSD and, nice. um, and it, for, with, with FreeBSD and it has been, uh, been just uphill for, or just, just uh, excellent cool. from there. Uh, so how did you first get involved with the Free, uh, FreeBSD Foundation and what do you do there? So I was involved um, with both the FreeBSD project and with the derived operating system that this company had uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, uh, FreeBSD plus the, the so-called secret sauce. Um, and I, I had a lot of work in both of those camps. Uh, but sure. over time, I started doing a lot more uh, on the open source side and making sure that all of our changes were going upstream, that, that general purpose FreeBSD improvements were being made that were of interest to the company, but, um, but sort of benefited the broad Right, community. weren't part of the secret sauce. Um, and, Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and over time, I think that's really where my interests um, uh, took me. And the existing FreeBSD Foundation board noticed the work that I was doing as mentoring other people into, um, into FreeBSD and sort of just participating in the broader community. And that's where my, um, my involvement with the, the foundation started. Uh, so basically, that was uh, uh, 2012 or so when I first started becoming involved with the, the foundation. Cool. And, and what do you do there now? So currently I'm working as a director of project development, which basically means that I'm managing the process for um, the, the project work that the foundation funds, which is both individual project grants to developers to do specific point projects, as well as longer term um, projects that we have now that we have full-time staff employed by the foundation we have a set of, of longer term sorts of projects that we can, we can take on. And so my role is to facilitate the, the gathering the list of, of projects that we want to work on, sorting out priorities, um, and mm -hmm. basically presenting to the board the, 
the of the foundation the list of of projects that should be funded and um, supporting the board in in projects are important to move forward with. Cool. So can you uh, tell us a little bit about what the foundation funds specifically, like what coding projects they do? Yeah. So the foundation's goal is largely to fill in gaps that um, that aren't being addressed through the broader community. Um, so the foundation doesn't want to step in and pick an area that that uh, that the board thinks is exciting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my things that other people are are intending to work on in a, in any any case. Um, so what happens is at the board's annual meeting, we have a discussion of high level themes that that are important to focus on. Um, and we base this on feedback from people in the FreeBSD community. We base it on visits we make with um, large companies that, that use FreeBSD and, and um, indivi individual supporters um, and just basically communication with as many different groups as we can to understand where, where gaps are um, in the sort of in the FreeBSD, um, uh, where gaps lie in, sure. in, in the technology we support. Um, the things and, that need to be done that maybe nobody's currently working on or yeah, so doesn't in have a lot the of interest. Cases, in a lot of cases, there are projects that everyone sort of universally acknowledges supported, um, but no one really is willing to commit the, um, the the full amount of effort it would take to to do them. Right. So um, the, the areas that we we discussed at the the last board meeting were security, performance, and developer tools as three sort of high-level themes we were interested in. And developer tools is a prime example, right? Everybody mm -hmm. wants to have um, a fully uh, a bug-free and fully working compiler and debugger and tool chain, um, but it isn't the sort of thing that any one individual is really going to say or, or any one company is really going to say, we're going to just put all the effort it's going to take to do this. Um, there's sure. a lot of people who have an interest in having it exist, but nobody wants to, to commit to the entire thing. Right. It's not something okay. exactly exciting that an individual developer is going to want to do in their free time because it's interesting, and it's not the kind of thing that some company needs to build their product necessarily. Uh, it's Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting, right? We actually do have in the FreeBSD community a number of developers who are doing a lot of work on toolchain components because they really enjoy it and they're doing it in their free time because they really like the, the technology. Um, but what's, what's interesting is the foundation's perspective is, you know, I think that's excellent and we definitely want to support that. But, you know, there are people maybe who are interested in moving the compiler ahead but aren't interested in taking on other pieces of the toolchain. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we understand that toolchain components overall are very important. We have a few people who are doing parts that they find interesting. We want to support them and we'll basically take on um, figuring out how to fill in the extra pieces of the overall story that aren't otherwise getting done. Cool. Sure. Uh, so uh, which uh, funded projects are currently underway and can you talk to us about some of them that were recently finished? Yeah, so we have um, a couple of different projects that are, are ongoing right now. Uh, we just started a um, a project with a FreeBSD developer as a project grant to uh, work on PCIe hot plug support, and so this is this is some work that um, had been done in a projects branch in the FreeBSD trio, um, and we're basically funding a, a project grant to take it to the the final level to get it integrated into the tree. So um, basically, work through all of the issues that remain on testing and figuring out all of the, the corner cases that weren't um, weren't addressed in the original proof of concept. Um, we have uh, a project ongoing right now for secure boot support. Um, so it ties into mm -hmm. the EFI, the UEFI project that we funded in the past and did some development work um, through our paid full-time staff. Um, but this is taking it the next level to be able to work in a, a full uh, secure boot in, uh, environment with a an off-the-shelf uh, set of keys that you'd find in a in a brand new PC um, that you buy from from the store. Uh, we also have a project ongoing right now that's in collaboration with uh, Semihaf and Andrew Turner um, to support FreeBSD on the ARM V8, uh, also known as ARM64 architecture. So this is basically the 64-bit version of the ARM architecture that is is poised to become very large in the server market, and we're collaborating in a in a broad project. To make sure that FreeBSD is well supported on this this, nice. uh, this hardware. Um, some other examples of projects that have recently completed. Um, we have the um, the AutoFS 
based uh, auto mm -hmm. mount daemon that um, uh, Edward worked on as a staff project. Um, so this mm -hmm. this is a, a re it's a replacement for the uh, AMD, AMD auto mounter, um, and it's it's just sort of a much smaller and, and tighter design. Uh, and we've had lots of feedback um, from people who have, have deployed it that it, it it works very well. It fits into the same sort of scheme that they're used to with auto mounters on other operating systems, and everything just kind of um, feels very comfortable for people who work in large um, mixed operating system deployments. So that that, that I think has been a, a quite a successful project that we've completed. Um, we also have Edwards native in kernel iSCSI mm -hmm. stack, um, mm -hmm. which is, is getting wide use in a number of FreeBSD derived projects, and I think that's that's been a quite a su successful project. Um, we also have the the console, um, the VT4 console update. And this one, I think, is not, um, it hasn't run quite as well as I might have liked. This is a project that we originally funded as a project grant um, quite some time ago. We mm -hmm. then funded another project grant to, um, to, to finish the integration and get it ready. Um, and there's some ongoing work. It, it turns out that it's actually just a much larger project than, than we anticipated when we started. So mm -hmm. there's ongoing work that's coming from, uh, from myself and others um, in the FreeBSD community and uh, FreeBSD staff to push the, the console um, to the, the finish line. It, it is the default um, in FreeBSD current right now, and I've been using it for a year and a half. Um, or two years, and from an end user perspective, there's a lot of things to like about it, but there's still mm -hmm. few things under the hood that, that need to get uh, cleaned up mm -hmm. there. Sure. So could you describe for us, like, for example, how you would get your project or idea funded, say you have something you'd like to bring to the foundation, what's that look like? Yeah, so for individual project grants, which is what I think you're um, mainly mm -hmm. speaking about here, uh, we have a, um, a proposal guideline document that has just gone up on, on our website. Um, it's about 10 or 11 pages and includes a sample proposal that, that shows exactly what we'd like to see in a grant submission. Um, and really, I think the, the key point that I'll, um, there's two key points that I will, uh, I'll identify for, for project submit, proposal submissions. And that is, the first is, we really like to see a proposal come in that has a very specific scope and, and uh, a developer associated with it. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I think we're, broadly speaking, we're very interested in hearing about the sorts of projects that people think need to get done. But for grant requests, um, we really want to be able to say, this project is, it, it has this person associated with it, they have the time available to do it, um, and this is the, the amount of money that, that it will take to, to make this, this proposal happen. Sure. Um, the main thing that we want to see in the grant proposal is a very clear explanation of how it benefits the, um, the FreeBSD community. So the, pro the proposals um, often will have a very detailed breakdown of what the work um, is that's proposed, and that's obviously mm -hmm. important, right? We, we need to, have to understand what the work is that, that's, that's, that will be funded. But really where some of the proposals uh, lack a little bit is very clearly defining exactly what the FreeBSD community will get out of this Mm -hmm. why it's important that this proposal goes ahead so that the community can benefit from it. Right. Cool. Uh, so how does the decision process uh, work for deciding which ideas actually make the cut? Yeah, so basically what we do is collect the feedback on areas that we think are, are important from companies and individuals in the community and keep that in a, um, in a list that we, we update over time with uh, uh, aggregate sort of um, themes. And... Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the, the de decision to fund individual projects is at the discretion of the board. So what we do is we take the list of, of areas that we've identified as being important, um, take an understanding of work that might be that we're aware of that might to happen in the community, um, and present that to the board and say, you know, here's the proposals that we um, uh, that that we feel should be accepted. We've been lucky in the past in that we've received generally speaking, very high quality proposals um, mm -hmm. and not too many of them. So it's, it's been quite, um, quite easy to fund proposals that come in because the, the budget uh, allows for it and there's, there have, hasn't been a lot of proposals that, um, that don't meet the, the needs of the, the community or, or, um, 
or the, the don't meet the guidelines of, of understanding how they'll benefit that community. Uh, there are some proposals that um, that we've turned down in the past uh, mm -hmm. that are either of general interest to FreeBSD, but they're just um, they're they're too expensive given the the budget that the foundation has today. So we you know sure. we'll have a we'll have a project that might come in that's proposing using um, seventy five percent of the year's um, grant budget, and uh, unless there's a very very compelling case for why that feature or project mm -hmm. is is important, um, it's just not really feasible to to spend yeah. that sort of money on on something that doesn't have a, a very strong benefit. Um, you need to get a good bang for your buck. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. The other case uh, we've had is um, sometimes we'll get proposals that. Uh, incidentally use free BSD but mm -hmm. don't really benefit the community per se so people will will occasionally submit a proposal that says I want to write um, a new networking protocol or something yeah. and I'm going to do it on free BSD sure. uh, and in some cases that that sort of work might be interesting um, and we, we wish we could find it but really the the foundation's mandate is specifically to support the, the free BSD project and community mm -hmm. um, and so often unless there's a, a compelling case to be made for that project benefiting the, the community, um, then we, we can't really uh, can't fund it. Sure. So, how do you deal with unexpectedly large donations when something like that comes in? Do you then expand, say, the previous plans, or work out a list and see what else you can fund? How does that work? Yeah. So, I mean, as as you know, we we received a um, a very large donation last year um, mm -hmm. that was you know we weren't. We, we, we weren't aware that this was coming, and it basically um, uh, effectively doubled our our fundraising in 2014. Uh, and it presented a little bit of a challenge because it's a lot of money that um, that may be able to fund a lot of new projects. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's basically a one-time event. Right? Sure, we can't count on 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 that sort of money over time. So. What the, the board has decided is to use some of the um, some of the funding to increase direct project funding. So we've taken ten percent of the the large donation from last year uh, as a sort of direct injection into the project funding proposal and then mm -hmm. pro project funding pool. And then the um, the rest of that of that is being established as an endowment that we'll spend over a couple of years. Um, sure. To just to support projects in future years, possibly ride through um, years if if we don't make our fundraising goals in the future. But um, that's not going to happen. I mean, really, it's it, what it's what it will allow us to do is have a few years of increased um, increased funding, and so um, the budget's on on the website. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Deb sent me the numbers, and we're we're looking at uh, increasing the what's called direct project funding um, from $122,000 in 2014 to $300,000 in 2015. So that, that is um, the individual. Correct. Nice. Yeah, that is the individual specific project grants um, as well as potentially other sorts of projects that come in under that, um, that umbrella um, and are not, specifically are not uh, hiring staff for project development work. Okay. Uh, cool. So then uh, are there any big future plans that you can tell us about or stuff that's coming up soon? Yeah, I mean it's 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 a little early to get into some to specifics on some some areas that are um, uh, that are in right. the works right now. But one of the things we really do want to do is find out how to be able to fund a lot more smaller projects, and that's something the foundation hasn't been able to do very effectively in the past because the overhead of setting up um, setting up the contract and the framework for Trend, pay, uh, money transfers and all of that sort of eclipses the amount of the the project if it's a um, a smaller dollar amount project. So that's one of the goals that I have is to put a framework in place that we can fund much smaller project grants where someone is looking to you know not not do a um, uh, multi month project development project, but a, a simple new a much much smaller kind of um, uh, project and be able to do a lot more of those. Cool. So aside from your work with the foundation, are you doing anything currently in FreeBSD that's an area you like hacking on? Yeah, so um, fortunately I've, I've been able to uh, uh, spend some time working on um, the toolchain components in a variety of, of areas. Um, 
both for the foundation and just for, for personal interest. Um, and so my, my historical focus, um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the, the this discussion was in the network stack, and so mm -hmm. that really is where I, I started doing a lot of work. Um, I haven't been very involved there on a day-to-day -day basis um, uh, in recent times. Um, really, the um, I, I, I'm one of those sort of strange people that actually enjoy working on toolchain components and uh, fixing up build systems and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm trying to do little bits of that here and there as as I have uh, have time available. Cool. Uh, one of the other things I'm also working on trying to do uh, in FreeBSD is, is move us towards a culture of communicating with upstreams more closely and mm -hmm. distributing work upstream more closely. Um, in some cases in the FreeBSD project, we do a very good job of that. And in other cases, we're very insular and we, we maintain projects, uh, a third party source in FreeBSD very well, but we don't communicate with the upstream in certain cases. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that's sort of a recipe for long-term disaster. Um, sure. As the upstreams keep doing, uh, keep keep doing new, developing new features and making improvements, uh, and you know we sort of make other different improvements in and FreeBSD port uh, porting effort, and that just keeps diverging over time. And and one of my uh, my goals is to try to identify where that's happening and try and convince people that. Communicating and working with the upstreams is, is a much better approach. Yeah, that one's kind of an interesting okay. case because, you know, we tell all the people that consume FreeBSD and make modifications, hey, if you upstream your not secret sauce stuff, when you need to go and update to a newer version of FreeBSD, it'll be easier mm -hmm. to pull it in. And then the project yeah. itself is then making the same mistake uh, with an upstream for, for some other component. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? This is a theme that comes up over and over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. I, I encountered it um, when I was working uh, at uh, startups in the past um, in talking with various FreeBSD using companies. They've all sort of independently learned it. Um, and I'm not sure um, why this is the case, but it just seems to be a, a trait that's common to people in the BSD world, uh, or at least certain people in the BSD world. Um, that you know, it, it just has to be learned. Uh, everyone sure. has everyone has to learn it the hard way eventually, and and the FreeBSD project itself <laughs> is going through the same process. I think it's just yeah. human nature to some degree. I mean, it's like doing docs, right? Well, I got the work done. I really don't want to spend the time to do docs. I want to move on to something else now. Yeah. Uh, do I want to work and send stuff upstream or not? You know. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think the the key is um, is not to look at it as I'm going to do all of this work and then try and send it upstream, right? Really. Mm -hmm. We want to get to a model of um, I'm working with the upstream. So as I, sure. um, I'll give an example. I work uh, on LLDB um, and make sure that it's working well on FreeBSD. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, I'm now a, a committer uh, or ha and have been for a little while in the upstream uh, LLVM repository. And all of the FreeBSD porting work that I do on LLVM happens in the upstream repository first, right? So there is no sure. extra step to push it upstream. And I think if we can convince people in general that that's a, a, a more efficient model, there isn't this extra overhead of, of, of doing it. It takes a little while to get started because you need to establish the relationship with that community mm -hmm. and have and sort of go through those those steps to to get involved there. But once that's working, it becomes a much easier on an ongoing basis. Uh, yeah, it is, you know, a uh, similar thing with ZFS. We were talking to Matt Ahrens last week about it and, you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to make their model easier to let people come in and bring stuff directly to them instead of having it be integrated into FreeBSD and then they trying to work out how to pull it into a Lumos to then yeah, push it out into it Linux out and so on. Yeah. And to tr try exactly. to solve that same problem. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, anything else you'd like to mention to us before we uh, finish up here? Uh, no, I think that's that's all, everything with me. Okay. okay. Well, thank you so much for being on the show with us this week, Ed. We appreciate it and appreciate you guys, uh, the work you guys do over yes. at the Foundation. Well, I appreciate the uh, show. Thanks, thank guys. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. That was uh, really cool to talk to Ed and hear about all the cool things the foundation is doing. So before we head into the news roundup, though, we want to mention the other sponsor this week, which is IX Systems. And of course, uh, that's a uh, URL, ixsystems.com slash bsdnow. And it looks like we got a cool guide they've posted this week, Alan. So what's this about? Free NAS hardware recommendations? Uh, yeah, so they um, built up this guide of kind of a best practices if you're going to uh, build your own mm -hmm. free NAS. Uh, so... 
this is kind of uh, a lot of the the wisdom that you get when you buy something from IX kind of boiled down and given away for free uh, from Freenas. Mm-hmm. This is written by uh, Josh Petzl, who's been on the show uh, a couple of times already. Uh, oh, and yeah. Yeah, and if Josh Petzl says it, it's pretty yeah. much gospel as far as free NAS goes. So, yeah, read this carefully. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, one of the things he mentions is whether ECC RAM mm-hmm. or not. And that's a, a big one we always hear about. So what did he come up with there? Uh, you know, <laughs> it says ZFS uh, <laughs> does something no other file system you'll have available to you does. It checksums your data and checksums the metadata used by ZFS. And it checksums the checksums to make sure the checksums have correctly checksum the checksum. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> if your data is corrupted in memory uh, before it's written to ZFS, ZFS will happily write uh, the bad data and the checksum uh, to the disk, of course, so would any other file system. Additionally, mm-hmm. ZFS has no uh, pre-mount consistency checker like FSCK uh, to kind of deal with things like that. Um, so that's very nice when dealing with large storage arrays because FSCK across the 64 terabyte pool would take forever. Uh, that yeah, ruins whereas day. Yes. A ZFS import <laughs> takes a second. Uh, even after, you know, power loss or whatever. Uh, however, if you have mm-hmm. non-ECC memory, uh, things can go sideways and so on. Uh, and it goes yep. on to talk about how much memory you should have, whether you should do, what kind of disk controller to use, how you probably shouldn't use it in virtualization, and so on. Okay. Well, fantastic. Yeah, this is a great article, and he talks even about virtualization versus bare mm-hmm. metal. So this is just a small sample of some of the really cool stuff you get from the guys at IX Systems, this kind of knowledge and expertise yes. just laid out right here in a, a free article. They're just handing mm-hmm. out, telling you how you can build your own free NAS box. Yeah, even though a big part <laughs> so, of their business is building the free NAS box for you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But yeah, so if they treat you that well and you're not even a customer yet, imagine how you'll be treated when you are yes. a customer. Or even when you're not so, uh, quite a customer yet, right? When you when you when when you're right. asking, what server do I need to do this job, right? If you email into mm-hmm. them and, you know, explain what it is you're trying to do and they'll help you come up with the uh, the right solution. And you'll notice the big difference yeah. between when you email them and ask questions like that and if you email some other hardware, say, is that IX is going to ask you questions back first, right? They're going to be like, we mm-hmm. need to know these specific things in order to answer your question properly rather than just being like, you should buy our most expensive server, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You want that one, the biggest one, right? (laughs) So uh, definitely, guys, the URL again, ixsystems.com slash BSD now. Let them know we sent you. We'd appreciate that. Also, if you go over to their uh, section there, they have uh, two new posts. Uh, One about the uh, uh, bulletin from the CEO about how they're uh, planning to do things in 2015. But also they have Mm -hmm. uh, the history of IX systems uh, where uh, Matt Olander tells the story of of how IX got to where they are. And, uh, you know, it gives you a better understanding of why IX is such a different company than the other ones that you might have dealt with before. You know, how, how they uh, sure. weathered the, the dot com storm and the whole, you know, the, the bubble back in the early tech days and, and mm-hmm. you know, doing an emp- employee buyout of the company and, and, and turning it around and making it back into what it uh, should have been. Definitely. So, uh, yeah, definitely some good stuff over there. So check mm-hmm. it out, guys. A lot of the good information you can get off their site right now. Okay, so first up in the news roundup this week, we have uh, Rolling with OpenBSD, Rolling with mm-hmm. Snapshots specifically. But uh, one of the cool things about uh, you know running the current branch of OpenBSD is that it doesn't require any compiling. Hmm, what do you know? Looks like there's a binary snapshots being continuously re-rolled and posted on the FTP site for every architecture. So... Naturally, that's going to make it easy for updating. So we got a cool uh, blog post here on uh, how you can roll with these snapshots. And you know, it turns out it's not quite as scary as you might initially think, especially if it's new to you. you know, anything new is a little scary at first. But uh, this blog post, I forget who the author was, uh, Adam Wolk. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is a, a pretty fascinating read here, which will teach you how to, how to set up your system to pretty much roll with the new stuff that's coming up, coming down from the uh, yeah, upstream. Yeah, basically saying, you know, uh, from the outside, the OpenBSD upgrade process, especially following the bleeding edge development stuff, looks really intense and risky. But uh, mm-hmm. after actually doing it, he says, hey, it's actually not that bad, and here's how it works. 
Yeah, so he pretty much details how the easy methods to, of how you would do this, get on board with the latest features, and how you can upgrade between them without a reformatting or having to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're running OpenBSD, this is something you may want to take a look at. He says uh, he ran it for uh, current for seven weeks this way, and he's come to the conclusion that it's not as unstable as people might mm -hmm. think. It's just worked every time for him. And uh, now he's, of course, helping to test out patches and new ports since he's running the same code as the developers are. Yep. So fantastic way for you to, to get caught up with everyone and then begin uh, be part of the process, the development I'm looking process. forward to the day where PCBSD can let me uh, run snapshots of 11 <sighs> that way. I know. I know, right? Yeah, it's coming. Uh, this year is going to be the year it's going to yeah. happen, I hope. <laughs> okay, well, next up, uh, signing package source packages. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a, a link to a mailing list post here. So uh, by the time the show airs, though, the official package source packages uh, aren't uh, cryptographically signed as of right this mm -hmm. moment. But uh, somebody at Joint's been working on that, and they'd like to sign their package source packages for smart OS in particular. So it uh, looks like they're using GNUPG mm -hmm. pulled in, uh, or excuse me, using it pulled in a lot of dependencies. So they're trying to keep the bootstrapping process as minimal as possible. Right. Uh, so what did they end up using well, instead? Well, in particular, um, the way Package Source works is it doesn't depend on anything from the base system because Package Source mm -hmm. can run on NetBSD and Illumos and Linux and sure. all kinds of different things. So it brings everything with it, its own compiler, everything. And so including uh, GPG and all this stuff would be pretty heavy uh so apparently they're using uh net pgp verify uh since they don't actually need to be able to do things like sign uh stuff all they need in the infrastructure is is uh to verify okay well that's and, pretty uh, cool yeah so maybe someday this will become the official way that we sign packages in NetBSD. But yeah, if you you do this in your organization or are interested in doing this go ahead and definitely hit up that link some good info mm -hmm. on there Okay, next up, I saw this one cross my uh, desk uh, earlier mm -hmm. in the week, but about the FreeBSD support model changing. Yes. Uh, so uh, I, starting with, uh, looks like 11 Right, release. I first heard about this uh, almost a year ago at the BSD yeah, Can Dev Summit. and It's been talked about yeah, for the, a while. Yeah, originally the idea was to have this ready for 10, but, it, uh, you know, it wasn't, mm -hmm. people didn't want to change it that quickly. Uh, sure. But sure. basically, uh, the big changes are instead of uh, the current model, which is, you know, we release 10.1 and it's supported for two years. Um, mm -hmm. And in particular, that led to interesting things where uh, FreeBSD 9.1 was an extended support release, so it was good for two years. And then 9.2 came out eight months later, but it was only supported for mm -hmm. one year. So it meant that right. 9.2 had. Uh, was end of life before 9.1 was end of life. And so they had to extend 9.2 yeah, and it just got sense. complicated. And uh, Also, that the, currently the way uh, the ports tree has to work on every supported release. And that causes problems, mm -hmm. uh, especially, uh, it's not so bad now, but like 8.3 had to be supported for a while and that was all kinds of old and, and didn't support anything. You know, uh, I think that was the one that was blocking making package ng the default everywhere. Uh, because mm -hmm. 8.3 mm -hmm. shipped with the old package tools, uh, whereas 8.4 shipped with the new uh, package ng stuff. And so once that finally, uh, once the 8.3 stopped being supported, they could move ahead and so on. But also, sure. uh, yeah, when they run their Pudrayers, because they have to support the oldest release, the Pudrayer build servers have to run the oldest version of, so they have to run 10.0, not 10.1. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Whereas with the new model, basically they'll support a branch, so 10.x, uh, well, I, I guess 11.x will be supported for five years from the first release. Uh, okay. And it won't be based on the release after that. So um, after the first release, the 11.x will be supported for five years. And when they release 11.1, you have three months of support to upgrade from 11.0 to 11.1, and 11.0 is gone. Mm -hmm. And then when they mm -hmm. release 11.2, you have three months, and then only the newest one is ever supported that way. Uh, sure. And... They will uh, also making it so that 12.0 can't come out earlier than two years later so that they'll never have to support more than three branches at once. Yeah. At a time. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like they're talking like a five-year lifespan for each major release regardless of how many minor points exactly. it has. Uh, so that means we can have more so, points more often because uh, currently the mm -hmm. problem is that that means more support load because you know the, the three points ago is still supported for another six months. Whereas now yeah, every yeah. new point will just deprecate the old one basically immediately with a three-month mm -hmm. grace window. Uh, 
Like that that is your that is your new yeah. support. Like oh you move up to the new well, point uh, release. So. The minor uh, point releases are all binary compatible and so on, so it shouldn't actually mm-hmm. be a big problem. You know, that's a one reboot upgrade type of thing. It's it's not a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Moving from eleven to twelve, that's a big jump and that's I that's a big people deal. need time to do that and it makes sense. But for mm-hmm. the minor point releases, uh, upgrading is easy and so it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Sure. And uh, well, uh, I guess mm-hmm. Uh, the other advantage to that is, for example, we can do a wrap-up release now, right? So 9.3 mm-hmm. came out, and uh, there's not going to be another release on the 9 branch because adding another release there would mean that it would have to be supported for another two years after that. Uh, and that sure. would cause endless headaches. And uh, nobody wants to do but that, right? going yeah. forward, that means that at the end of that, all the stuff that's in 9 stable, you know, all those fixes that went into 9 after a release never got released, uh, whereas now mm, with these branches yeah. at the very, very end, we can just do, all right, here's the last release. It's not supported anymore at all because uh, that branch mm-hmm. has had its five years. But if you're still using it, you can at least get all these fixes in place uh, in the meantime yeah. while you work on upgrading uh, to 12 or whatever. That'll help you, help you get through the transition period a yeah. little longer. But the biggest thing is it means it'll be a lot order easier for the ports team uh, to advance stuff because the old versions will go away quicker. Uh, mm-hmm. oh, also, the security cool. officer and the ports management team have the option to extend support for any individual numbered release or branch at their discretion. So they can decide mm-hmm. to keep supporting an older one if it's got enough use and it's not going to cause them problems to keep supporting it. Uh, but they're mm-hmm. not going to be required to see, uh, support you know, 8.4 for well into 2016 Forever, yeah. for no reason, basically. Yeah. That's cool. Well, there's a lot more detail. The mailing list mm-hmm. post is actually really detailed yeah. on what all this and means. It explains and all, they what's wrong with the old model, yeah. what the advantages to the new model mm-hmm. are, and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so definitely give that a read. Some good information there. Okay, next up, uh, we talked about OpenSMTPD recently, mm-hmm. and we've got another post now talking about setting up OpenSMTPD with uh, Dovecot and Spam Assassin. Mm-hmm. So how cool Very is good. that? But. Uh, We've talked about uh, setting up your own BSD-based mail servers in the last few episodes, but uh, this post in particular is is what laid out really well. And a lot of people are asking, you know, how do you combine open SMTPD with spam filtering? And this post finally reveals the dark secrets that make that happen. Uh, yeah, spam so assassins are uh, quite good because of its, uh, mm-hmm. you know, its score-based stuff, and and uh, I guess because of the way it's integrating with open SMTPD, it it's not requiring much uh, feature from open SMTPD. It just happens sure. after. But yeah. Yep. But uh, yeah, this post also covers some uh, other tidbits like SSL certificates, setting up PKI and MX records, and some of the things that maybe our previous posts didn't have mm-hmm. included. So uh, I guess he, he talks a little bit about doing this on Linux and BSD. So when you're reading this, just mentally replace some of the apt get commands and the ETH0 interface with something a little bit more sane for your BSD of choice. But uh, also, in related news, OpenSMTPD has got some interesting new features oh, coming really? soon. You want to tell us what some of those are, Alan? Um, which link is that? <laughs> oh, no, sorry. I will, I will discuss yeah. them then. So it looks like they're adding initial support for the sender's map feature, uh-huh. which should be so that, slick. So that when you uh, send inter- email, it changes the from address for you? I believe so, cool. yeah. Um, um, also, uh, introduce K mail uh, ADR map lookup service, and then the senders map feature now supports a one to many uh-huh. feature. So, this would be That's pretty cool. So, yeah, some definitely cool new features coming. And then, see, there was yes, a second the second link thing here. was uh, that they're planning yep. to switch to Libre SSL uh, by default, even for the portable version. So, I don't know if that nice. means they'll bundle Libre SSL in the portable version, portable version, or if it'll just depend on it, or what. Uh, It'll probably just depend yeah. on it in the port street. Like you need LibreSSL to run this, but yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah. Good job, guys. That'll be uh, interesting to see how that works. Uh, you know, the, the mm-hmm. some of the hold dive with switching to LibreSSL is making sure the apps support it. So, uh, you know, having specific apps that are designed around it, uh, using it, uh, will maybe see it mm-hmm. uh, push forward a little more in, in various places. Yeah, let's look. Mm-hmm. Okay, next up, uh, ThinkPads. You know, a lot of us have ThinkPads, mm-hmm. and this article we have here is talking about a ThinkPad T400 and running FreeBSD 10. 
So uh, BSD laptop articles seems like we're seeing a lot more of these. It's getting more popular, and this one in particular is about the T400 series. And uh, like most of the ones we've mentioned before, this article is going to show you how to get a BSD desktop set up with uh, all the little tweaks you may not think to do at the time. But uh, this one's a little different in that it takes a much more minimal approach to how you run your graphical desktop uh, instead of a full featured environment like XFCE or KDE, which which I would prefer. They're using the i3 tiling window manager. Mm -hmm. So how elite is that? <laughs> so if you're a command line junkie that basically uses uh, X11 to run more than one terminal at once, this is pretty much the ideal setup for you. And uh, as bonus, the post includes some extra bits and details about uh, using DRM and KMS in the 10.x branch as well as the new uh, VT uh, console driver. Mm -hmm. So you'll definitely want to take a look at that if uh, you're interested in rolling a new laptop with a free BSD here soon. Yeah. Um, admittedly, I mostly use KDE to run many terminal windows, but I also use my browser and stuff. It just looks good while yes. it's doing yes, it, right? Yes, <laughs> There you go. Okay, and lastly for the news roundup, I will mention that we did release uh, PCBSD 10.1.1 uh, just this last Monday. That's our big quarterly update. So it's still a FreeBSD 10.1 under the hood. We haven't changed you know, the world or kernel necessarily. But the packages have been updated and a bunch of new features have been rolled in. Uh, a couple of the big ones to mention here, the automatic updater service has hit. And this is basically the feature that uses boot environments and uh, some clever usage of Cheroot to do automatic background updating so that you can be using your system all day and then at the end of the day it just tells you, hey, you need to reboot and when next time you boot up it boots into the new environment mm -hmm. uh, all ready and ready to go. So nothing gets changed on you while you're using it, which that annoyed me. I don't like I don't like upgrading things in place when I'm currently got stuff open. Like, ah, uh, don't don't crash Firefox. Yeah, that sucks. I've I've done that to myself <laughs> a couple times. It's like oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that changed. That needed to change. Um, other other things to mention, uh, all the utilities have been merged or uh, migrated to QT5. Mm -hmm. So uh, they look pretty now. It's shiny and new. Uh, OVA files, just so if you're running a PCBSD or TrueOS in a VM, there are now OVA files available for download. And the other big one was uh, Jelly V7 support with Grub. So you can now do full disk encryption with Jelly V7 using uh, the Grub bootloader, which means you don't have a unencrypted slash boot partition with UFS or anything nice. else. It's truly one Z pool. Everything's encrypted, and the bootloader will prompt you for the uh, your key when you boot up. Yep. And it does all the pass-through and everything, so it doesn't even need to ask you a second time uh, at the mount root prompt. Mm -hmm. So definitely check that out. That's what I run on my laptop it's here, so and it's fancy. fantastic. Yeah, it's very fancy. <laughs> so, oh, and I see anyway, you disabled those ugly disk ID labels. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, yeah, I did that towards the end. That's Those things annoy yeah. me. Well, at first it was GPT IDs, and then I was like, oh, now I'm getting disk IDs. Turn those off. And Yeah, the disk IDs, uh, I don't know. they're just hideous. I I can see why some people would want them in FreeBSD, and I you know more power I can to see you. How let's, if you we were, just make them not the default. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's ZFS picks them up first because it scans alphabetically, and disk ID yeah. comes before GPT label. Uh, yeah. Well, the problem we so the problem I ran into uh, with our VMs in particular, when we were rolling them. The ZPool would import, and then it would get some disk ID. And then that would screw up the swap partition. The labels wouldn't work now because mm, yep. the labels were labeled on dev ADA or, yeah. or whatever. I, I had the same problem actually in the FreeBSD installer yeah. when I was writing it. I, I was using yeah. the swap label so that it didn't matter which way around you were doing it. Your, sure. uh, if depending on your disk layout, the swap would be f at the beginning or the end. Uh, and mm -hmm. in, or if you were doing the encrypted one, and you had to have the extra unencrypted Z pool that had to come before the swap instead of having swap. Sure. And so I wasn't always sure which ID the swap was going to be end up with. So I did the GPT label and that was going to be mm -hmm. great, but then the disk ID would take over and break everything. It would just disappear yep. and it's like, oh, I have no swap now. That's that's no fun. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's been turned off now for convenience sake. Plus, it's just easier for me to type in dev ADA0 instead of dev disk ID and then some 32 character yeah, long Especially with the string. Western Digital so, Drives that have percent 20, percent 20, percent 20, percent 20. Oh, 20. yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's that's all uh, in there now. So I, I can see the usefulness that. in that it's supposed to be based on the drive serial number and stuff. They're mm. definitely better than the GPT IDs, where all your disks have yep. something that looks almost the same, but isn't exactly the but same. But a couple characters and somewhere. It's, it's not two, the characters at the, the end. Different. It's it's kind of no. the latter half of the very first section before. The, yeah, the end of the first yeah. section before the first dash. There's a yeah. couple of characters that are different. It's like, what? <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. And you're trying, especially if you're in a situation where you can't copy and paste exactly. and you're like trying to read it and type it in, like, oh, yeah. that's, that's a pain. So 
anyway, all that stuff has been nuked. Awesome. So uh, thank goodness that, that stuff's gone. But yeah, definitely go ahead and update now. We have a link to the blog post uh, talking about how you can upgrade your 10.1 system to it. And uh, of course, send us feedback. If you're in any issues or have any suggestions, we're already hard at work on the next quarterly update. And as Alan has mentioned, I do want to get those current images out mm-hmm. soon. So hopefully that will happen here shortly. That was part of doing this automatic update or was now we can do current images and do like a rolling release <laughs> that can... Uh, so in the background, your FreeBSD world and kernel will be updated. And then when you boot up, it'll go through and install the new packages, which maybe aren't API compatible and all that. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a future show as mm-hmm. it's uh, when it gets released. Okay, we're going to get into the feedback and questions. But before we do, it's time to remind you guys, you need to be doing backups, yes. right? So Tarsnap's going to make that happen for you in 2015. So tarsnap.com slash BSD now. Go there, get set up. You know, put a few bucks in the account. I think, is he accepting Bitcoins now? I, I think so, yes. Uh, yeah, he yeah, does yeah. that by so, uh, Stripe. Yep. Yep, definitely. So uh, Tarsnap makes it super easy. You can back up everything off-site. And because it's encrypted before it leaves your box, you don't have to trust or even care so much about where the data ends up. You know nobody's going to be able to mess with it or look at it or or whatever, which is the way all backups should be. Yeah. Uh, I, so, I meant to do it and I forgot. I was going to grab uh, throw up my invoice on the screen. I got my invoice oh, yeah. for January for a, a whole like 24 cents uh, right. for backing up all of my source code that I can't afford to lose. Uh backing it up every right. day with differentials so that, you know, each day I don't write that much code. So there's not that much that changes. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, even though I have, you know, 700 megabytes of, of stuff backed up, it only ends up costing me like 25 cents. Yeah, yeah. So there's pretty much no reason not to do this, guys. Exactly. And a tar snap makes it super easy with a tar-like interface and clients for just about everything under the sun. So Yeah, somebody wrote in out. and asked what, what we yeah. meant by like tar-like interface. It's like the command line is exactly the same as tar, mm-hmm. except for, yeah. you know, when you put something.tar.gz or whatever, you just put whatever you want to call the backup in tar snap's database. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, so, you know, what you're backing up and the date you backed it up or whatever, and, and that's it. Yeah. Now, that's all we mean by that. So if you know the tar command line syntax, this is not going to be a steep learning curve. Right, and, and just... then somebody linked to the, the old XKCD about, you know, to defuse this bomb, all you have to do is correctly enter the tar syntax without having to look it up in the man page. I'm like, I've, nah. I've never had that problem. <laughs> I, like, I learned tar, I don't know, like 1998. Well, and... <laughs> my previous job before BSD was working on a tar backup program. So, yeah, yeah it's... A lot, yeah. Well, a lot of time it just makes there. sense, right? <laughs> it's tar, and then you know X for extract or C for create, uh-huh. and and then F for what file you want to put it in, and then the list of files you want to do. It's it's not that hard. Yeah, come on, guys, this is real yeah. easy. So yeah, definitely get set up, and Tar Snap will let you make that happen. Uh, I don't think it's out quite yet, but if you are stuck, there's uh, going to be a Tar Snap mastery book coming out from my friend Michael oh, Lucas nice. soon. So that will uh, help you along if you need more help. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, first up in your questions this week, uh, Cameo writes in asking about jail networking. He says, hey, guys, love the show and all that. I've been trying to set up an open VPN client inside of jail, but I haven't been successful. If I understand correctly, it has something to do with the fact that the jail shares the network stack with the host OS. I've seen some postings saying you should run the VPN client on the host and then export the interface referring to the VPN to the jail. Uh, but I think that leaves some routing issues. Also, I think that the vImage feature gives the jail its own network stack, question mark. Yep. Would that let me uh, run the VPN client inside the jail? I keep seeing references to vImage being beta and unstable. Is that true? I'd love to, for you to talk a little bit about this feature in particular, but also more about jails in general, since I think this is one of the killer features of BSD. Another note on vImage. When creating jails on FreeNAS, there's a checkbox for vImage on or off. So I'm guessing that enabling it should be uh, easy. Thanks for your awesome work. Uh, well, well to, not quite that easy. You have to compile it. In, well, I think no. I think he means he created a jail on FreeNAS already, and it's off. Oh, and he okay. wants to then turn it on. I don't sure. know how easy that is because it changes quite a bit of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So to use vimage, you have to compile it into the kernel, which is just adding an extra line to the config file and recompiling it. Sure. But um, vimage works pretty well as long as you don't try to use it with pf. Uh, mm-hmm. There's some issues there. They're being worked on actively now uh after a long time of not being actively worked on but yeah um so yeah vimage would give you your own uh networking stack in the jail so that you could do stuff uh basically allows the jail to actually have its own separate routing table and so on Mm -hmm. um 
To run the VPN client inside the jail, you might be able to do it if you enable the raw sockets feature of jails, which normally is off because mm -hmm. allowing somebody in the jail to do that would is you know not normally what you'd want to do to allow them to, to have that level of access. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, basically the way jails work is uh, they don't get access to an interface. They get access to one or more specific IP addresses. And so they see all the interfaces, but they only see the IP addresses they're specifically allowed to use. Assigned yeah. that one. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can run uh, OpenVPN on the host machine uh, and then export only the IP address you get from the uh, VPN client. So on your tap or tune interface, whatever IP address you actually get when you connect to the VPN into the jail. Mm -hmm. And that'll work. It shouldn't have any routing issues It'll uh, because it'll use the host routing table. Um, Mm -hmm. So the easiest way would be run the VPN client on the host and then just make the jail use the IP it gets from the VPN uh, rather than a local networking sure. IP or whatever. Um, or you can use vimage and run VPN in the jail. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, I hope that helps you out. Okay, next up from, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, how would you pronounce that? Um, Shao? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll go with Shao. But uh, anyway, asking about PCBSD versus FreeBSD. He said, if I recommend PCBSD to someone who's never installed any kind of BSD, do they have the full freedom to experiment with all the FreeBSD commands underneath, including getting source from SVN, recompile the system for patches and updates, or is there a limit to what the user can do before they start breaking PCBSD customizations or add-ons? He said, I want to take a couple people step-by-step -step away from the GUI config to down to doing it all in shell and eventually get them on to using OpenBSD. Can I start them on PCBSD or should I start on FreeBSD so there's no limits in terms of breaking anything in the default installation? Um, yes and no. So here will be some of the caveats to that. I mean, yeah, you can check out FreeBSD sources. Uh, our kernel's pretty much identical yeah. to theirs. I, I don't even think there's any patches in it no. at this point. It's just mostly like Etsy config stuff. So yeah, you can definitely grab new kernels, recompiled world, all that jazz, and, and go to town. You're not going to have an issue there. Um, we have our own package repo, which does have some custom packages in it, which is like ship our utilities yeah, um, and whatnot, you, although I've put that in FreeBSD ports. Now, right. In so. general, uh, I've actually taken my PCBSD, I think it was a 9.2 install mm -hmm. um, when I did it, and then written, a, a, I've recompiled custom kernels of newer versions over mm -hmm. top and done all kinds of nasty things to it. Um, in general, it works quite well. PCBSD does a good job of when they do customize stuff in ETC, it's in, you know, rc.conf.pcbsd that then gets included. Yeah, we created, we created our own files so that when we ship updates, it doesn't, right. you know, and so anything it's, it's very much just vanilla FreeBSD with the PCBSD packages on top of it. Uh, and I mm -hmm. think on your wiki, do you still have the instructions to convert a vanilla FreeBSD box to PCBSD? We may. I'll have to check and see. That, so the, the deal with that is now, with the new updating system, it pretty much uses Boom ah, right. Yes. And so you have to, to have do that. set up. Yeah. So that, that, I would say, is the only big difference between FreeBSD. Is, it's not so much that FreeBSD can't do it. It's just that we require you're on ZFS, yep. on root, with boot environment support which uses our Grub bootloader because that's the only way to do it at yes. the moment. So as long as you're not telling them to restamp the bootloader or whatever, you're in good yep. shape. And then you can use the boot environments and do all your custom free BSD work and, and you know, get the security and features that those provide so you can roll exactly. back. Like, if you do the you kernel have, update you and you user. break it, yeah. you can just choose the old one out of the Grub menu and you're back to a working yeah. PC BSD. Exactly. So that's that's what's going to be kind of cool that you can do that. So the the only caveat will be is if you see some previous to utility telling you to like restamp boot block with GPT ZFS loader, don't do that. Just uh, let PCBSD do its grub thing. It'll build the menus and, and away you go. But uh, yeah, I think this is a perfectly legitimate way to do it. I mean, if you open up a shell and get get a root prompt, it's FreeBSD. Yeah. We're not restricting any commands no, in no, any way. It's, uh, so. all very much real FreeBSD, uh, and that's mm -hmm. one of the things. I like about PCBSD is, you know, I can put it on my laptop, I get all the extra stuff, everything's all set up for me, and everything works, uh, mm -hmm. but I still have access to, you know, if yes. I want to write a patch for FreeBSD and, and compile test it and run it, it, I can do that without having to worry that That's right. my system is so how, uh, somehow so much different that it's, it's not the same as, as doing it on vanilla yeah. FreeBSD. That's correct. So, and then eventually that'll be the idea of doing like current images as well. Again, you're just running FreeBSD current and hopefully more people can use that uh, to develop and stay current with what's going on yep. upstream. Okay, I hope I answered your question there. Next one is uh, from John asking about FreeNAS and PCBSD. 
He said, hey guys, couple of things. FreeNAS to PCBSD ZFS replication. He says, I have a main FreeNAS machine which runs like a champ, 24 by seven. I also have a much lesser spec, although not terrible, old machine also running FreeNAS. I just use it for backup, no services. Using the ZFS replication feature built into FreeNAS, it replicates across, also like a champ. He said his plan is to add an OS uh, SSD uh, to the backup chassis and then convert the backup machine into a PCBSD machine for the kids. However, he would like to keep the ZFS replication going, kind of like a life preserver um, in reverse, which is a PCBSD utility for those mm -hmm. who don't know. He said, I've used the UI to set up ZF ZFS replication in both the FreeNAS following the docs. Is there a similar tool I can use for my main FreeNAS to push to the PCBSD machine? I don't mind blowing away the data on there now and starting the replication again, as I also have an off-site backup. As a suggestion to others, this is just a 4 terabyte external drive. I keep my locker at work, so if the house burns down, that drive is safe. Basic, but of course, it good, works good for a home user. And then uh, he said, FreeNAS link aggregation. In FreeNAS, you can configure lags. Could you guys run through the options, pros and cons for each? Any special network gear required for it to mm. work? And then he lists the various protocol types. As always, love the show. Keep up the great work. And thank you for all the advice, news, and awesome tips you give weekly. Seriously awesome. I can't thank you enough. Yes. So I'll answer the first question he's asking about. Uh, is there a tool? There's, there's no tool specifically in PCBSD to set up the FreeNAS replication. You're going to be doing it just from the command prompt setting yep. up. SSH and uh, you know ZFS commands the, to set it and up. And there's there. a nice little script for that called ZXFER, Z X F E R. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. That uh, I'm actually the maintainer of now, uh, and it it does See? that. Um, <laughs> I don't know how the when you configure the replication in the FreeNAS GUI, it's just SSHing into the other machine and doing it. But I'm guessing it it gets some information from the remote FreeNAS to fill in some blanks. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what all the details yeah. are it requests there. I thought it was just a you know simple send and receive. Well, if it is, there then may be other bits as long there. as it has the right SSH keys, it might you might be able to make it, it work. Just work. Uh, that's a very specific FreeNAS question, uh, so you might be better off asking that on the FreeNAS forum, just specifically how that replication feature works, and can you you know just replicate um, your FreeNAS to any FreeBSD or any machine that Free has ZFS at all, really. Yeah, it should be the same process yeah. either way. Uh, so for your question about link aggregation, you listed a bunch of types. Uh, the first one, failover, that's where you have two or more network cards, and it always uses the first one unless the first one is listed as linked down, like the cable's unplugged or you know the switch is plugged mm -hmm. into failed or something happened. Then it automatically switches over to the second one. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what failover is. Uh, FEC is uh, Cisco's... like. Um, Fast Ethernet coupling or something—I forget what it stands for. It's actually, if you read the man page for the uh, LAGG driver, it's just a synonym for round robin. So I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, LACP is the uh, link aggregation control protocol. That one requires a switch that has LACP set up and is uh, enabled. And basically, it means that each uh, NIC will talk to the switch and be like, "Yes, I'm alive," and the other side, and uh, the switch takes care of the load balancing. Uh, the way the load balancing works with LACP is uh, it looks at the outgoing packet, specifically the source and destination IP addresses, I think MAC addresses, IP addresses, uh, and then decides which packets will go over which port. So if you're just doing a single like ZFS replication from machine A to machine B, the way the hash works is always going to send it out one of the ports. If you were sending to two different hmm. machines, then you'd have a 50-50 chance that there would, one would go at one NIC and one would go at the other NIC. Um, on the FreeBSD side, it has support for actually going up to layer four and looking at different port numbers. So as long as it's just a port number is different, uh, so if you had two streams going to one machine, uh, they might actually go over the different NICs. But most switches only look at the MAC address and the IP address. And because of that, it means that your FreeBSD would send out both NICs, it would get to the switch, and then the switch would try to send it out only one NIC down to the other machine, meaning that mm -hmm. uh, you would only end up getting one gigabit out of your two gigabit NICs anyway. Um, so that's where the load balance method comes in. In load balance, FreeBSD doesn't require the cooperation of the switch, and it literally just sends packets ev uh, out um, either port. It's basically the same as LACP, except it... Um, it doesn't require cooperation of the switch. Uh, it just load balances based on its own stuff and and basically sends packet out based on the hash. And again, like I said, it can use mm. uh, the layer four stuff like the TCP port. And then round robin is ignore the rules and just send packets out every NIC. So 
if you mm-hmm. have three nicks, the first packet goes out the first one, second packet out the second one, third packet out the third one, and then the fourth packet goes out the first one again. And it just fires yep. packets as fast as it can out of every port that's in the lag. Um, your problem is that the switch on the other end will be like, oh, all of these are destined for one particular yeah. MAC address and try to send it down one port again. Uh, I've done <laughs> I've done so some much. crazy things with setting uh, VLAN IDs and stuff on the switch to to get the switch to keep the three streams of packets separate as they get to the other mm-hmm. box, which happens to be FreeBSD, and can then reconstruct the packet from it. Uh, so you can sometimes actually make round robin work. I uh, do realize though that it technically violates the Ethernet standard uh, because the frames are supposed to happen in order, and you're blasting them all over, then they might get out of order. But if it's right. TCP, it's going to put them back in the right order anyway. So you can actually achieve uh, a couple of gigabits this way. I've I've done some nice. fancy stuff with uh, the load balance or round robin setup, uh, ridiculous configs on my switches, so that. I have a machine down here that with two gigabit NICs and it can actually send two gigabits across two switches and end up being received on a 10 gigabit NIC and actually getting the two gigabits. Uh, nice. But yeah, it's very complicated. I was going to say, for those who don't know, we use the lag interface on the desktop as well. That would be the case of when you have a Wi-Fi and right, Ethernet. Right, failover mode, right? So, yeah, we use failover mode, so if your Ethernet gets disconnected, it switches back to the Wi-Fi, and when you plug back in at your desk, it switches back over to the Ethernet. So, uh, yeah, definitely handy. And the chat room asks, oh, okay. uh, can you do LACP between two directly connected machines? So if you just have two machines and you just directly connect their Ethernet, mm-hmm. uh, you wouldn't LACP wouldn't work because the switch wouldn't be there to talk to, but load balance mode would give you the same thing because uh, load balance mode is just... Oh don't negotiate with the other end. I'm just going to do the hashing myself and I'm willing to accept packets on any incoming port. Whereas LACP is I'm going to negotiate with the switch and decide how to do this. Okay, cool. Well, next up is uh, Sean asking about SSH on Windows. He said, I have an open SSH question for the show. I run a 6.7 P1 underscore one on FreeBSD 10.1. Today I changed my SSHD config file so that I use the ED25519 host keys. And he shows I think us the uh, link how he did that. he changed it to only do that one, and that's where he ran into the trouble. Yeah. But, yeah. Yep. He said, after restarting the open SSH service, I couldn't connect using PuTTY anymore. Uh, luckily, I kept an SSH session open before restarting, so I didn't get locked out. After reading the PuTTY website, of course, PuTTY does not support this type of key yet. Do you know of any other Windows SSH clients that can be used that supports this type of key with SSH? And then he lists how he's also set some other ciphers. Again, what SSH Windows client will I use that will support the ChaCha20 Poly 1305 cipher? I've been trying any secure SSH client. I'm sure there's plenty of Windows users out there that want to connect to their free BSD server using SSH in the most secure configuration possible. Yeah, those he said when he th- came, those two mm-hmm. are uh, the Poly 1305 and, and uh, ED25519 are very new still. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't support them yet. Um, sure. And yeah, the problem is a lot of the Windows clients are pretty old. Nobody's really interested in making a new one per se. Um, mm-hmm. so TJ actually wrote a, a nice detailed response to this guy. Uh, and I've, we got the link to that in the show notes as well, where he explains, um, uh, but, uh, you know, he basically walks about the, the shortcomings of putty and how, and, you know, things based on it, like, uh, FileZilla and WinSCP have the same problems. Mm-hmm. Um, the only workaround really is to use the SIGWIN, which is basically gives you, uh, it's a compatibility layer yeah. to run POSIX binaries on Windows, and then you could use real open SSH. But, you know, that's going to be... Uh, that's a little bit basically harder to do. Basically, you're hard. back to using the command prompt uh, or command line on yeah. Windows. Um, I don't know uh, what anybody's uh, plans are for getting uh, support for newer stuff in a, a Windows SSH client. Right? That seems like a question that's uh, best sent into the putty people. I don't know... Uh, you know, even on a brand new Mac, which of the newer ciphers are supported, I imagine probably not the newest one. Uh, Mm -hmm. And yeah, if it's anybody other than you connecting to it, you might want to consider that. Also, uh, I don't know what uh, key types the SSH client on my phone supports. I want to make sure I didn't lock myself out of my phone as well. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Because, you know, sometimes when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you need to make a change, uh, being able to connect to your phone is uh, very handy. Definitely. 
Okay, next up is uh, Christopher asking about uh, package locking on PCBSD. He says, on my current PCBSD desktop, I have several locked ports. In other words, he says, uh, Nginx, Postfix, RelayD. These all require OpenSSL from ports, and also Nginx needs Lua enabled. This means I'm messing out on the excellent automatic update system, which was recently added to PCBSD uh, 10.1.1 that we just talked about. He said, I've seen this in action while testing RC1 and 2, and I want to use it on my main desktop. So I must find a solution to the locked ports. He said, should I just move them to jails and update them from a custom Podria setup? Or is there a way to update the host system and still benefit from the automatic updates? So yeah, the automatic updaters now is going to flag you. If you're using locked ports, it's going to say, hey, you're doing some manual stuff here. You're probably going to want to run package uh, upgrade manually is what it's going to suggest. But uh, yeah, moving them to jails in this case may be your solution yep. so you can then update the uh, host system. Nginx, Postfix, RelayD, those should all be able to be run from a jail yep. without an issue. Um, and then you can uh, either you know build them yourself or pull them from another a repo. If you found another repo that has the options you want, um, one thing I'll mention to you as well, and I have put this call out to others, we've done this for a number of people, when you find ports like this that need some flags and you have a good reason for wanting them on, a lot of times we will turn them on in our repo for you. You just right. got to uh, you know, send you know, it in, suggest it. Uh, using OpenSSL from ports might actually be mm -hmm. something that uh, PCBSD might want to do. The um, yeah. uh, Lula in the Nginx port is less of an obvious one that everybody less would want. Less desirable, yeah. But definitely, these are the kind of things. Submit a bug report, send it in. We will chew on it and decide if that's something we can turn on. Then maybe you don't even have a reason yeah, for so having to roll your own. Your automatic updater just doesn't do it or does it do the update well what will happen is it'll it'll stop right. you if it detects that you've manually locked guess, ports it's going to stop it's going to stop you because we don't actually uh, we upgrade don't you the, we don't use package upgrade right yeah. you uh hopefully this will be solved in future versions of the package tool where when it detects that you compile something custom from ports with a specific option the upgrade process will consist of automatically recompiling that port for you uh, for now, right. that's if, not... If that goes in someday, yeah. maybe that's what we'll do. But at, at this point in time, no. Yeah. And and part of the reason we made this change was, like like you said, it detects, oh, you've locked stuff now. So when it goes to the update, it can't solve dependencies, and it kind of breaks the whole automatic yeah. part of automatic updating. So we That just, is the uh, nice thing about jails. It allows you to have that separate set so that it doesn't interfere with mm -hmm. your other stuff. And then you can modify that and update that as yeah. you need and, be. And, you know, those... The ports, the three you mentioned here, those are tiny. Yeah. You could probably just compile those out of ports exactly. yourself. Exactly. Uh, you probably don't need to do, run yeah, you don't need a whole Poudre for that. You could literally just no. uh, update the ports tree in the jail and compile those mm -hmm. three things. It's They're not going to be over the that heavy. Would, yeah, that would be the, how I would do it in this case. Okay, excellent. So next up, it's time for the mailing list gold. So thank you guys for sending those in, by the way. We appreciate that. So what's the first one we got here, Alan? You said you know what's I, going on I don't on really, but... Um, this was oh. <laughs> uh, apparently somebody ordered uh, a pizza from uh, Pizza Hut and uh, put their email address as questions at freebsd.org. Thanks, guys. We appreciate that. Yeah. But they kept the full address in there yeah. and everything. This, well, this is, yeah, the delivery receipt or uh, order receipt for ordering a pizza. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> But uh, anyway, this is actually a prank, not spam. Yes. So, uh, yeah, nice. Yeah, Good at first I wasn't sure that. if it was an, a real Pizza Hut order or if it was some kind of, you know, phishing scam. But no, this one's a prank. Uh, random stuff that happens like on the internet. It looks like there was a reply to it as well. Probably. I, I'm sure somebody tried Randy, to explain. Randy, are you trading pizzas for quality code? <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, next up, uh, pretending to be a VT220 yes. on a Mac. So, so you got the picture you can show here, uh, Alan? Yeah, um, so this is um, emulating an old uh, terminal type uh, VT220 uh, using a PowerPC Mac. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically a mini how-to of actually what you have to do to uh, make... Get the right fonts yeah, and all that. To, to make it look like an old uh, deck VT220 on your <laughs> old Mac. I'm not entirely sure why they wanted to do this, but... Uh, Somewhere, somebody thinks this was, like, the high point in computing and, and wants to it. It definitely it. looks awesome. like, you know, the old-fashioned computer you're expecting to see. You kind of, like... You can see the numbers, the digits look like they're made up of little dots, like a like a like an old LED screen. Yep. 
this would be cool for like movies or props or something, right? Exactly. That's the one that launches the nuclear missiles yeah. or whatever, right? It's ancient. That's very cool. Well, awesome, guys. Thank you for sending those in. We mm-hmm. appreciate finding these every week. So, of course, as we wrap up the show, we want to remind you guys, uh, send us anything you find. Feedback at bscnow.tv. We would appreciate mm-hmm. that. And we'll make sure it works its way into a future episode. Of course, if you're doing anything cool with BSD, either at work or as a hobby, let us know about it. We love hearing about those things. If you have someone specific you want us to track down and try and get an interview from, let us know as well. Or, of course, tutorials you'd like to uh, see. We're just an email away. We can make that happen. And, of course, uh, live Wednesdays, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1900 UTC. Hop on the the chat and we can uh, talk with you while we're recording the episode. Maybe answer some of your questions live, which is cool. Yes. So anyway, and see you guys same time next week. Okay, yeah, I was now. just going to say, uh, if you're going to be at Asia BSD Con, make sure you come say oh, yeah. hi to us. And uh, if you're working on anything interesting uh, there, we'd love to uh, interview you at some point uh, while we're there. Uh, the in-person yeah, interview is always a little bit more fun. And let us know maybe ahead of time if you know you're going to be yes. there and you'd like to do an interview, we can, and we'll try getting the questions written up ahead yeah, of time. Yeah, because A, you can get a copy of them that way and have a little more time to think about it, but also... Uh, I just remember our first interviews uh, was in um, Malta, like interviewing mm-hmm. Paul Hennigamp. And I'm like, I don't remember what to ask him. I had this giant like, there's list. There's so much good stuff to ask. Yes. And then you go blank. You're like, oh, yes. I'm, I'm lucky gonna we're going to get it. I'm glad we're going to get a second chance to interview PHK so I can ask him so all the questions I forgot to ask him the first time. Definitely. So, yeah. So, let us know ahead of time and we'll make that happen too. But uh, thank you guys for being with us. We'll be here same time next week. Mm-hmm.